Okay, another beautiful day, crisp springtime air outside. Today I'm going to first review with you the calendar, the deadlines, what's going to happen during the next few weeks between now and the final exam. Then I'm going to open the floor for questions on the paper. I will, of course, offer a brief introduction, basic suggestions, but more than anything, that segment of the class is supposed to be an opportunity for you to ask questions from the most basic to the most specific. After that, I will return, go back to the format of the final exam. I have returned your responses during the practice run that we did last week. You can retrieve them in front of the class. And there too, of course, you find a few comments in your uh, pages that I return to you. But there too, I will offer a few words of advice. After that, with the time we have left, I will continue with my analysis of Green Book with the help of frames that are indicative of the narrative pattern of that particular film. Okay? So, this is the next to last week of classes. Next week, we are going to have the last road movie which is Drive My Car, Oscar as Best International Feature Film of 2022, a Japanese film by Amaguchi, based partially on two novellas or short stories by Murakami. It's a very nice film. It's a very unique take interpretation of this genre. However, keep in mind that this being the last week and the next being the last week and this being the last film, there won't be any assignment on it. I want you to focus on the big tasks ahead of you once you're done with the viewing notes for Green Book, which, by the way, are due on Monday, right? I know this can be the last part of the semester can be a complicated uh, part, of course, if you are habitual and your routine is to complete the viewing notes, the assignment by Friday, you're free to do that. And please simply leave a comment to the effect of I'm done. You can review and grade my notes so I don't have to wait until Tuesday morning. Otherwise, you have until Monday, until the end of Monday, May 1st to finish the last assignment. And after that, as I said, you just have to prepare for the final exam, complete your final essay, as well as everything you have in your other classes. The program for next week will be simple. I'll be talking about Drive My Car on Monday, providing the synopsis and my analysis of the themes the structure and the style of this film. I will show a scene on Wednesday, but Wednesday I will not be taking attendance. It'll be the last class. I want it to be a kind of celebration of what we've done up to this point. So perhaps I'll show a scene or two from the film, but more than anything, I would like to just hear your voices again, engage in a discussion, hear your reactions about the film you've seen during this class, or the things you've learned, if you want, as, as a simple reflection, right? Nothing, uh, you can be direct and, and frank as much as you want. I, I don't mind at all. Now, the week after that, when you have reading days and then finals, Keep in mind that during that week, both on Monday and Wednesday, as usual, I'll be available on Zoom. If you have questions while you're working on your final paper or preparing for your final exam, 
as usual, I recommend that you use the Calendly app to schedule your time slot. I will still be there with my Zoom windows window open, but if I don't have anyone and you just walk in virtually, I will move you from the waiting room into the actual Zoom room and talk to you right away. But from the waiting room, you don't know whether I have one student, two students ahead of you who have, who have reserved time slots that can be up to 20 or 25 minutes. Okay, so that's best yet, even if you want to try, nothing wrong with trying. And after you wait in the, in, you've spent a couple of minutes in the waiting room, don't, don't sit idling there, come back later or look at my schedule. Okay, so take advantage also of this. Keep in mind, even during the week of finals, you can find me not in the office, right? Just in the Zoom room. May 10th is also the deadline for the completion of the final film essay or paper. And by the end of that day, by 11.59 uh, of, of Wednesday, you have to post your paper inside the same Google Docs file, right? And as we've done up to this point, you leave everything there. You, you don't erase, you don't remove your various viewing notes, film essays. You simply place the paper on top as the most recent um, assignment, right? And that's where later on you'll be able to open the file and see my comments, see the grades, the grade that you had. Keep in mind this time that after midnight of that day, you will lose your editing privileges for the file. Okay, so unless you request and obtain an extension, you will not be able to work on the paper into May 11th, okay? However, from May 11th on, you will retain your viewing and commenting uh, rights to the file so that you can both see my comments and if you want, respond to my comments on the paper itself, okay? And of course, I will, as I said, talk about the films for the final paper just a little later today. Same as for the other two days, even on Thursday, as I usually do, I will have office hours on Zoom in case you need me, you need to consult with me for the final exam. The final exam itself will take place between 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. The location is, in fact, this room. I got confirmation this morning. While I was coming here, I received the message, so I will update that later, but no big surprises. It is this room. Come ahead of time. Make sure that by 8.30 you are in the room because of the format of the exam. As I said, at 8.30 when I come in, and I'll come in earlier as usual, when I come in, I'll throw you out of the room with your staff. Okay? I will ask you to wait outside while I place the exams on the seats and then I'll let you in just from that door in single file and we'll fill up. You're not going to sit exactly where you're sitting now. I will going to ask you to fill up uh, the, the rows one by one, sit in front of an exam, don't move the exam, just sit on in front of the next exam uh, when, when you come into the room. 
at 8.30, I will give you permission to turn the exam and look at the instructions. The instructions will include a brief summary of the three scenes that will be shown that day, that morning, and that you're supposed to offer your commentary on. I will give you five minutes to focus especially on the first one because I want you to engage with the showing of the scene, knowing what to expect, having thought about what you want to look at, what details you want to write down. And of course, you'll have paper, right? I'll provide paper for the official responses, but also extra paper for your notes, so that if you want to take notes while I'm showing the scene, you can, but be strategic, be selective, because it's a response. Each scene will demand a response of 400 to 600 words, like three pages of handwritten, right? So it's clear that there are more things to be said about the film and that particular scene that you can put on paper. So be strategic, include the most relevant, the most interesting, the, the, the deeper thoughts, the, the smartest, the most brilliant observations. So again, I'll give you the first five minutes to look at the summary of the first scene and the others as well, if you want. Then at 8.35, I'll show you the first scene. And every 25 minutes after that, I will show you another scene with about 10 minutes left at the end for a general review. Each scene will be between 5 and 10 minutes, closer to 10 than to 5, okay? So come on time, okay? Because if you come in at 9.15, all you have to go by probably is the summary itself of the scene in order to make up for what you've lost. As I said, the the summary will include also basic information for you, such as the name of the characters the year of the film, the title of the film, the name of the director, okay? Because it's not a test of your ability to memorize small details such as those. So I'll go back to the exam later, but the first thing I want to talk about this morning, as promised, is the final paper or essay, and as you know, there is a page. I've added more links to this page, which includes all the films, right? And with each film, you find links on where to find it. They're all on Amazon Prime. And Just Watch provides you with alternative more streaming platforms. You usually find some frames from the film. I've provided some reviews, but of course you find more. The purpose, my purpose for these reviews was to give you a sense before you pick a film of what the film is about. So I give you a few reviews to facilitate that, but then it's up to you to find more using Google, using the databases provided by the university. I would recommend Project News, especially, M-U-S-E, and then JSTOR, where you can do an advanced search with the title of these films and find if there are any articles that are worth mention, right, and you have, so inside Louis Davis, The Man in the Hat, Nomadland, and Keep the 
the road. And that's the starting point with these links. Let me tell you a few things and then you can ask me more questions as you're thinking about this project. In general, the basic would be that the film, the last film essay has to have the format of an essay. It's not a long essay. It's between 1800 and 2700 words. The most important thing to keep in mind while you're working on it is that it cannot be a generic review or analysis of the film. Your primary goal is to show me what you've learned during the semester. And since this was a class focusing on a particular genre, which is the road movies genre, you're supposed to show that presented with a new film, a film that was not treated, discussed, analyzed in depth in the class, you yourself independently can do the same kind of work we've been doing during the semester in reference to the other 13 films that were presented, analyzed, worked on by you in the form of viewing notes or film essays. So you have to primarily analyze this film as a road movie genre with possibly, I would recommend it, some connections, comparisons with other films that were presented as appropriate, right? You don't have to force this or compare apples and oranges, picking two films, the one you choose and another from our list that are completely different. And it's a selective comparison, right? Meaning this character, this situation, this theme, this visual style is reminiscent or is vastly different from this other road movie, right? Not rather than a point by point comparison between the two. So with this in mind, with this kind of goal in mind, even the first paragraph should not be generic, right? If I had a dime for every film essay on Mad Max that began with something like, this is an action-packed dystopian film set in a post-apocalyptic world. Okay, I've read it in your essays, I've read it in a hundred blogs and reviews online, very generic. If you want to start with the right foot for a paper that is about a road movie, and you don't have a more creative idea. I'm not saying that you should all embrace my formula. But if you were starting with some generic two, three line summary that is the repetition of the same template you find online, avoid that and rather begins. The man in the hat is a, add some kind of label, road movie, which is unique for these reasons. And then, if you want, lacking any more creative, more custom ideas, rather than being generic, then the rest of the first paragraph and your introduction can be a presentation of the so-called matrix, the various components, the five components that I introduced in my first week as the basic features of a road movie, right? Destination, <coughs> transformation, impersonation, road, etc. And explain how this film contains some of those elements, may not contain all of them in the same relevant way, and anticipate how you will be treating, discussing some of those elements the element of destination transformation in reference to this film 
in, in, a, in a way that matches the contents and the style of the film itself. The core of your paper has to be a, the articulation of your arguments on how this is a road movie and what kind of road movie it is, supported by plenty of specific references, details that indicate the visual cues that you find in the film, and the analysis, possibly the in-depth analysis of at least one sequence, one scene, one situation, one character. Again, even if you are working on a single movie in a paper, you cannot say everything. If you're trying to say everything and being comprehensive, then you'll be, you, you'll be moving too quickly from topic to topic. You'll remain too shallow. And your, my comment, and, and you know my comments, right? What I insist on, generic, bad, specific, good, depth, good, in-depth analysis is good. Because I want to see your, again, what you've learned from the class and your newly acquired skills to handle a film from this genre, okay? So don't feel the need to make the final paper into another set of viewing notes, <coughs> reviewing the whole film. Even the synopsis of the film is not necessary, it's not required. It depends on the kind of outline that you have in mind. But even if you want to include a paragraph with the outline, make that outline a selection of elements that make the reader understand how this is a film, a road movie, and what kind of road movie it is. Meaning, leave out details or small scenes or small characters, secondary characters, that are not relevant for the understanding of this film as a road movie. That would be a synopsis that is not generic, but it is custom made that serves the purpose of supporting the reading of the paper. Clearly, I don't know if I need to say that, I did find at least one example, negative example, uh, that would, would encourage me to add these words. Of course, keep in mind that when you're writing a paper for this class as well as any other, you're writing with the average reader in mind. You're not writing for me, Andrea Fede. So you're not writing to someone who knows the movie already and can fill the gaps. You need to provide a context for your references, right? You cannot jump from one sequence to the other, etc. Okay? So those were my general recommendations. And I'm hoping now that I can have the opportunity to add more after the, the stimulating questions that you're going to ask me now. Okay? So Raise your hand, and uh, of course, if your question is specific, mention the title of the film that you've picked among the four listed on this page. If it is a generic question, it doesn't matter, and I can myself pick one of these films to exemplify and support my more detailed answer, okay? Yes, Patrick, example, right? Yeah. What's a good example, example of like uh, going in depth for you know when, like can you just give an example of how you what you mean when you say in depth for you know less generic but... So let's use Green Book as an example. An in-depth analysis of the relationship between the two main characters, Don Shirley and Tommy Lip, would be one that borrows the example of one of the sequences in the car and explains what is happening during that particular sequence between their departure point 
and their arrival to a diner, to a hotel, to a new location, and explains what is being said in the car, what are the dynamics of the interactions, of the verbal interactions, and then adds a visual element, because cinema is a visual art, and therefore, what is the position of the characters in the car? What are the camera angles? And what are the angles doing? What are they adding to the interaction itself? What are the props? Because even inside the car, you have the radio that is shown at some times. Near the radio, Tony Lip keeps the small image of St. Joseph carrying Jesus on his shoulder, right? So there are all sorts of specific details from the actual words used in some lines to the position of their body in the car, right? You have Dr. Don Shirley sitting back in a corner, stiffly, and trying to move as far away from the driver he hired. And you have instead Tony Lip placing his big arm on the front bench, turning, invading the space of Don Shirley, right? Intentionally breaking into his space because his whole goal is to take the character of Don Shirley into his world. So, that would be one way where in one paragraph, half a page, you develop a single sequence of a couple of minutes, three minutes, adding enough details to give a comprehensive analysis and presentation of that particular scene. Of course, this is one example and there are many variations on that because as a supporting example, I used a short sequence, which is the easiest way, but that could be reached even just by focusing on one character through different scenes, right? And so that, in reference to the Green Book, could be achieved by focusing on what is that Don Shirley does in the car, and simply looking at his side, his reaction, his posture, the camera angles, any kind of props that you see in the frame when he is sitting in the car, the way he is dressed, whether he's reading, what he is reading, if he's eating something that is given to him by Tony Lip, what is he eating, eating and um, how does he handle the food, etc. Right? Either way, what I've done is be selective. And that's the reason why you don't have to worry about covering the whole film if you pick scenes, moments, or characters that are representative of the theme of the film. Then, if you haven't had an opportunity to do it earlier, a good way for a conclusion instead of the boring, let me summarize this five-page paper you've just read because you're an old, an, an old timer with Alzheimer and probably have forgotten what I wrote. Instead of that, an alternative to a generic conclusion would be placed there in the conclusion. This is, I've shown what kind of road movie this is. Let me place this in the context of the class with brief comparisons to one or two other films. It compares to another film because you have a lot of scenes in a vehicle or because the characters are doing a lot of pretending, impersonating on the road, etc. And so this would be a way to close in a way that is not repetitive and also add information, add knowledge, show the depth of your knowledge in reference to the whole class after you've analyzed one of these films. Do you have a follow-up question? Okay, good. More questions. And even if you want to ask the most basic of questions, such as 
which film should I pick? We can talk about it. Now, of course, all together, or schedule a meeting as soon as possible. And let's have a conversation where I can talk again about these films. Of course, you can also review my presentation of these films. You go back to you, the, my YouTube channel, you can search with the title of the film, see when I presented, let's say, The Man in the Hat or Hit the Road, see what I had to say, because what I tried to do was to offer a view of the themes and the style of the film so that it, you can see whether it resonates with you or not, okay? Try to make this something that is not so much of a struggle for you. Pick a film that you feel comfortable working with. Last call for questions. Let me put on the screen again the short list for the final exam. Here too you find more stuff. So I added for each of the four films for the exam the where the links were to find the film and would be advisable to watch them again. The links to the YouTube classes, and you know that not only you find a YouTube video, uh, uh, YouTube videos for every class, but inside you also find book chapters, video chapters. So you can skip the introduction, you can skip if that day I talked about anything else, go straight to the analysis of that film. So it's not even two full hours or 110 minutes that you have to review for each film. It's less than that, right? You skip the introduction, you skip uh, if I presented a film uh, that wasn't that one and you go straight to reviewing. And um, I've done that for every film in this list. Again, I will pick three of them. So. You can try and guess what I will pick. Um, what can I add? Uh, if you came in late, here in front of the class, you find two piles, A through K, M <coughs> through Z, with the responses you completed if you were here when we did the practice. And I showed the segment from Itumama Tambien, <coughs> and I asked you to write an outline or a the simulation of a response, and I put some notes. Feel free to ask me questions if those notes are limited. I tried, I, I didn't give it a grade, it didn't make sense to me. Rather, I tried to either encourage you, yes, you're on the right path, just do more of this in the exam, or I provided hints that during the exam maybe you could do things differently. And here, too, let me offer a couple of general recommendations. And the first one would be, the exam is made of three scenes and three essays, short essays. So you shouldn't be writing bullet points. They're not viewing notes. You are supposed to write down notes while you're watching the sequence the day of the exam, but your response should not be, Luisa answers the phone and Yano tells her that he has had an affair, that he had sex with another woman and she cries and then she hangs up and she turns the phone so that he cannot call her again. It shouldn't be a description of the scene. It should be an essay. So it should be something like the turning point in Luisa's life in the film Itumama Tambien is not when she receives a call from Yano telling her that he had a sexual affair with another woman. Because in fact, she knows, we learn later, that he betrayed her. The turning point is instead the fact that Yano calls her not so much to confess 
his violation of their marital bond has to be consoled. He's crying and he wants to be comforted by her, reassured by her. And when she understands that their relationship is uneven, that she is acting more as a caretaker, as a mother to him, that's when she breaks off with him. And after that point, Yano will not be shown in the movie anymore. He will remain just a voice. She will live in an empty apartment. She will call him again, but he will be just a voice. And although he entertains a relationship with Julio and Tanakh, they're not a replacement for Yano. Exactly because she knows that she's dying, and she knows that they themselves are not looking and not able to have a long-term relationship. So the reason why later on in the film she will have sex with them is to be in touch with the vitality, the life, the feeling of a, an, an endless future that is associated with those characters, and also as a way, as we learned from the conversation in the car, to go back to the time of her first love in Spain with whom she had a profoundly sexual, intimate relationship. Okay, So this would be a way to develop an essay, and even in reference to the scene shown in class, you can be selective. Just show me that you understand the significance of some of the elements in this sequence. And the sequence will be closer to 10 minutes simply to offer you a range of topics and pick the ones that you're more comfortable with. You don't have to uh, do everything to cover everything. And as I've shown in my example right now, in my improvised example, it's good not simply to show your understanding of the character in that sequence or how the sequence is built, but also how it relates to the rest of the film, right? Showing your knowledge of the story, the development of the character, etc., with an essay format rather than a bullet point descriptive format. Of course, if you do the bullet point, if you do the generic descriptive way, you will receive some kind of passing grade, probably, but try to do more, something different, and, and get a better grade. So, at the end of the class, please come and pick up your response. If you didn't have a chance to try that, you can schedule a meeting with me to discuss the details of the exam. Any questions right now in reference to the final exam? Yes, please. Um, so, uh, we like My final exam is not based on questions. So I'm not providing questions in the form of a prompt as I did for the uh, assignment on drive, where I said, focus specifically on the colors, on the significance of red. No, I would be, in that case, showing you, let's say, the scene where he is in the supermarket, and then the sequence continues with him in the parking lot, the door to his car, left slightly open, him approaching her, all of them going back to the apartment of Irene and Benicio, and showing that sequence alongside with a short summary, it's up to you to pick up elements from that scene, whether it be the colors or the colors and or something else such as the way they that, that uh, they interact, the driver and Irene, and then a good way to expand on that and connect this to the rest of the film would be to talk about how different 
the driver behaves during the night wearing his scorpion silver jacket or during the day, such as in the sequence that I would show you with the mini supermarket and the apartment. You could be talking, of course, about the different backgrounds when the characters are presented and interacting in the apartment, she with uh, brick red uh, tiles, he with this green turquoise uh, wallpaper behind him, or the fact that at some point when they're talking, you see her, but next to her there is a mirror, and they do all, all movies do that, right? When they, they, they don't want to go back and forth as they used to be in the 1930s, Irene's face, the right face, so they have a mirror so that you see the face of the driver reflected, but in the corner of the mirror you also have a picture of Santa Gabriel to hint that there is a potential competitor, uh, someone who's going to interfere in this potential relationship that is developing between them. So no prompts, I'll just show you th these three sequences I'll provide a summary so that you have some specific details and it's up to you to pick a way to discuss some elements in the scene, okay? But it's your choice entirely. What else? Okay, good. I, I think it was a productive segment. I still have about 15 minutes and last time we discussed the initial sequence for Green Book. And we also talked a lot about southern Italian culture, the logic of a clan or tribe in that culture. So in reference to it, keep in mind what I said. And now you understand that when Tony Lip is scheming, pretending that the hat of Gio Lo Scudo has been lost accidentally or perhaps even stolen by the guy he beat up outside of the Copacabana and then will be returned by him personally to Giolo Scudo without asking for a reward, this is not simply to make money. In the logic of a culture where you have different levels of membership in your clan or community, this is one way to be part of Giolo Scudo's clan, to uh, obtain the protection of Giolo Scudo. So it's not about getting a tip. <laughs> Rather, it's about getting the umbrella, the protective shield for him as well as his family, guaranteed by the favorable disposition of someone like Mr. Lo Scudo. Okay? And you also understand that as much as Tony is a hustler, he's not classified, presented in the film as a small-time criminal or a bad guy or an evil guy. Because the logic is he's doing this for the welfare of his family. And within the concept that I introduced on Monday of familial amorality, the idea is that when it comes to my family or my clan, the same rule that society uses to classify someone as immoral, dishonest, or criminal need not apply. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, you see from the beginning Tony Lip beating up to a pulp this guy and this serves several functions, right? One is to show the animalistic portrayal of Tony Lip, right? Because he revels in this kind of situation. He's very happy. He 
engages Viggo, Viggo Mortensen. He did a wonderful job. First of all, he put on this much weight, right? So became very credible. But he has this healthy approach to both eating and beating up people. He does it with gusto, right? And uh, now this serves the purpose of showing him as, as a kind of person who has this primitive nature, right? But will also support the turning points or twists that establish the story. Because otherwise, if the premise is, I have a racist guy, right? No doubt about it, the glasses, the scene with the glasses, get rid of any uh, apprehension over there. He's a racist. You have a racist guy who's going to be not only the driver, but also the protector, the trouble solver, the problem solver, the, the, the one who handles trouble for a black guy. How can that be? How can that happen if it's so racist? So you have a series of turning points that establish the need for him to skip town because the guy he beat up is a member of the mafia and you don't beat up a member of the mafia, right? Uh, without punishment, without revenge. And also because later the Copacabana will be closed. He's without money. And so he has no alternative other than accept a job that uh, is, is not the most comfortable for him as a racist guy. So, I said twist number one is this, but in many ways this is the first twist, right? Twist number one, the Copa is closing. This will motivate him economically to be the driver for a black guy. Of course, at home, you see him as a small hustler, right? If you can make the image, which is kind of dark, he's covering the fire hydrant with a trash can, right? so that he can park the car in front of his house. So that's what he does, right? Small cheats, small, uh, has, small time hassling. And in the scene with his friend and family, the scene is mostly about racism. By the way, this is his brother, the, the brother of Nick Balelonga. Uh, what was his name? Frank, I believe, or Frank Jr., right? So he is related to the screenwriter, and you see the screenwriter in the film as well. He died last year of an overdose. Someone dropped his body from a car. They drove to a building and, and threw the body out of the car. Uh, he, he was only 60, and, and this, of course, is Sebastian Maniscalco, if you know him. Best line in the film by Sebastian Maniscalco and his wife having heard of the letters from Tony Lip says, oh, I want a letter like that. And he says, yes, dear, soon as you make a meal. And of course the glasses, etc. And he will initially refuse, right? to the, the, the position. They will both come to the conclusion that they're not a right combination, that he doesn't want to work as a valet, a personal assistant. He thinks that he might not be right uh, because he's married, among other things. But the twist number two, and this is Nick Vallelonga, right, playing the part of Ogi the Mafioso, and if you remember, there is this interesting setup because they're eating lunch in this <coughs> pub or bar uh, inside a box. And the box is made like a Catholic confessional with even a curtain. And, and Tony Lip prepares himself psychologically before opening the curtain and getting in and is interrogated by Augie who proceeds to tell him that the guy he beat was a mafia member, so there has to be retaliation. However, it was about a woman. 
and in a public place, and therefore the mafia member violated internal rules, and so retaliation, punishment will not happen. But this is not very reassuring. This is just further motivation for Tony Lip to skip town, right? Because the guy might be looking for him, or some of his accomplices might be looking for him. So this is supposed to motivate to explain why this racist guy will go and spend time with the black pianist. Of course, he needs money, so money is also another motivator. They show him giving up, giving up his precious watch to uh, this guy who owns a pawn shop. Finally, the other twist is the push coming from the wife, right? So something that Tony Lip has not taken into consideration, his wife would suffer because of the distance, and this scene establishes that the wife is on board with the proviso later on that he should write letters, right? And you have the scene outside of the house to explain that, the green book, the request for the letters, etc. Now, let me jump to the one of the segments for the road. Let's pick this one, for example. So, the film has a very basic repetitive structure. So, let's take this segment. They get to a motel in Ohio, right? And usually, you show, before they get to a place, they show the car, the road, and then they show a frame with the place and also the name of the place where it is. Now, from this point, it's a combination of these things. In this case, she's reading his first letter. And this is before Don Shirley helps him write more poetic, more romantic letters, right? And this is very brutish. So don't worry about me not eating good, I'm eating good, etc. Right? Very repetitive, very basic. And then also the letter testifying to the change of attitude in Tony Lip is like a genius, I think. Meaning, remember, the rules of admission into a clan, respect can be one of them. Then you see them in the car, and what happens between them? Reciprocal education, incidents of racism. So in this case, Tony Lip is supposedly educating Don Shirley about black music, and showing that uh, Don Shirley is not in touch with the black community because he doesn't know Little Richard, Chuck Berry, uh, the uh, Aretha Franklin, right? which is both about the theme of education is also racist, right? Meaning all blacks should know black music. Then Tony explains who he is, about his world, how he's a bullshit artist. And again, this is the scene I mentioned before, the radio, the image of St. Joseph carrying Jesus. And this is the savior trope, if you want to, right? He's carrying Don Shirley and protecting him in the same way. This is after, in the same sequence, they stop and for gas and food, and he, Tony Lip, steals a, uh, a turquoise rock, right, from this, this place. But then, since he picked it up, he says it, it isn't stealing. This is his world, his rules. But at this point, first, he educated Don Shirley about black music now, Don Chile is educating him about morality, right? This is not moral. They leave, and we move to the next segment, right? And segment by segment, you have a series of small anecdotes, stories. Keep in mind how the movie came up with stories on the, on, from the road told by the real Tony Vallelonga to his son. And